technology. It doesn't always do what we want it to do. So who wants to look at some tarantula private parts? I know I do. Hello tarantula lovers, I'm Alex and you're watching Tarantula Haven. Before I get started today, I'd like to give a couple of shout outs. The first one is to Tarantula Shani, and she sent me a sticker of her YouTube channel and uh, I'd like to show that to you. So yeah, if you could pop over there and check out her channel, I'm sure she'd appreciate it. The other one I'd like to give a shout out to is Gavin of Gav's Tarantulas and uh, he asked for people to volunteer if they wanted to collaborate with him on a video that he did so I threw in my two cents and uh, collaborated with him so um, check out his channel and check out that collaboration and I'll post that right there so that you can go check it out so back to the topic of my video um, I had intended on making a video last week but um, I, it was going to be a feeding video and I shot a lot of the feeding clips on my iPhone and um, you know it shoots beautiful 4k video which is why I used it but it, I filled up my iCloud space and for some reason I cannot take the video off of here and I've tried everything I've, I've even tried different methods of downloading it and uh, it just will not come off and it's stuck in here so <laughs> I can't utilize that video right now and, and there were several good clips that I wanted to use and uh, so until I figure that out and clear up some space and I don't want to pay for more space because I, I'd like to make money not lose it to everybody else so anyway that is I'm not, no longer going to use that for my channel until I figure things out and can get it off of there reliably. So I'm gonna to stick to my old reliable, my 1080p camcorder here because this thing never fails me. So anyway, a good thing happened in those feeding clips when I was shooting them. I discovered that three of my tarantulas had molted. Um, one of them was my Gramostola poker peas. The other one was a Brachypelma albopelosum. And I had one of my Dolicothelia diamantinensis. And um, so I've always see on some of the tarantula communities that I, tarantula communities that I belong to, a lot of people always want other people to help them determine the sex of their tarantula and a lot of times they'll submit some crappy looking pictures and they're like what's the sex of my tarantula so uh, I figured it would be a good topic to cover how to determine the sex of your tarantula I better be careful with that uh, YouTube seems to have a problem with the word sex so uh, if you include the word sex in your title or in your keywords or anything like that, um, you usually get flagged and you get demonetized for it and you have to fight with them to get, get it remonetized and all that kind of stuff. So if you notice the title of my video is determining the gender of tarantulas and that is because I'm avoiding the word sex because they think it's a dirty word and it always pops up and gets flagged. Uh, that and sexing. So uh, we will not be sexing tarantula molts today. We will we'll be determining the sex of tarantula. I just said sex again. Dang it. Now, everybody has their own method for determining the gender of their tarantulas or sexing molts. And, uh, you know, whatever works for you is great if that is the best method that you have. Um, but there are people out there that just have absolutely no clue. Some people would like to ventral sex, but uh, you really have to know what you're looking for to ventral sex a tarantula. I'm still learning that and I hit and miss here and there. A lot of people will post stuff on, on those communities and I give it a shot but usually your experts will come in and they'll tell you for sure and sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong so you know it's one of those things where you really have to have a good eye for it and a lot of experience and I'm not quite there yet but the best way to do it is if you have a molt you can actually look in there and you can see the the sex of the tarantula so that's probably your best method of doing that 
Now, the easiest way to do it is if you have a fresh molt. If you just caught your tarantula molting and the molt is fresh, it's still kind of gooey on the inside, that's the best time to do it. If you, if you catch that, as soon as that tarantula gets off the molt, go ahead and pull it out. It'll still be sticky on the inside and you can spread it out and you can look at it. Um, if your tarantula is three inches or above, then it makes it a whole lot easier. When you're talking about smaller tarantulas, it's very difficult even doing this method. So um, some people actually use microscopes. I use my camera, whether it be my camcorder or my DSLR, I get in there with the macro lens and I shoot a picture of the uh, molt so that I can see real close and determine what the sex of that tarantula is. So what if you don't have a fresh molt? What if you look in there and your tarantula has already molted and it's been a couple of days and their molts or exuvia are dried out little husks and you know, what do you do with those? Well, there is a way, it's not a lost cause, there is a way that you can still determine the sex of your tarantula with these molts. Um, there are methods that you can use to moisten them up and that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. So how do you rescue a dried out molt to determine the sex of your tarantula? Well, first of all, you need to have a couple things on hand. You need to have some water and I've got my trusty little water bottle here that I can use to squirt on there and you need to have some liquid soap. It doesn't really matter what kind of liquid soap as long as you have some. You're not going to need all of this liquid soap. You're just probably going to need a drop or two and uh, that is basically the main ingredient to softening those molds. Now a lot of people will use a small bowl or something to this like or like this and uh, they'll put the soapy water in there and soak the molt in there but I find that I have a difficult time pulling them out of the bowl with the soapy water and not ripping the molt um, so I would rather avoid that. I usually like working on a flat surface to begin with and that way I can just spread things out and I don't have to worry about transferring it from one place to another because it's already brittle and it's really soft and once you moisten it and you get it in that soapy water it's going to get really really loose so um, it makes it difficult to, to transfer it without tearing it up. So you know that's just my personal preference. So one of the things that I like to use is a piece of plexiglass. Any flat surface that you can use is fine, but I like to work with this piece of plexiglass and the reason for that is because it's clear and I can set the mold on top. Sometimes you need a little bit of backlighting so that you can look underneath and shine it through. So it's good to have a little flashlight and I can just put that underneath so I can shine light through it and maybe see the parts a little bit better. Another thing that I like to have on hand is I use these little bamboo skewers and they're for making like shish kebab and things like that. So I keep a pack of these around. And the reason why is because you're gonna have to spread out that molt. It's real delicate, it's real hard to do. Um, so if you're using tweezers or something to that effect, they tend to be a little bit harder and sharper and they can tear your molt up. So I use these wooden pieces of wood, these wooden um, skewers because it's it's a lot more gentle for me and the wood actually has a tendency to stick to the molt a little bit so I can stick it and pull and it just kind of spreads it apart. You can use toothpicks or anything like that but these give me a lot of room to work with so I can you know work pretty good with them. So I use these bamboo, bamboo skewers but you can use whatever you have handy. Um, and I also like to have some q-tips on hand. Um, Q-tips help you e either sop up some of the extra water or they can help you in my case to put the soap where you want it and not have to worry about getting too much on there and you just need or use what you need. I'm starting with my Grandma Stola Poker Piece Molt and uh, I'll start out by pouring some water on it and like I said before most people will usually soak it in a dish but I prefer to pour water on it. Now tarantula exoskeletons are hydrophobic. What that means is that they are um, they repel water so if you put it on top of water it's just gonna float and it's not until you add the soap to it that it causes it to break that surface tension that it has and uh, the mold will begin to absorb water after that. 
Now I usually pour it right inside the sternum area of the tarantula because that kind of helps catch the water and then it just spreads from there. And once you pour, put the soap on it, then again, it just, it just starts to absorb the water. And then I pour a little bit more and now you notice it just starts getting wet and it doesn't repel the water anymore. Then I'll use my skewers to try to flatten out the mold as best as possible. And carefully, I'll try to spread out the abdominal area. And I have to be real careful here because the skin here is very, very thin. And now that it's moist, it's really easy to rip. So I just kind of spread it gingerly as best as I can. Now, next, I'll drain off as much water as I can. Um, this helps to avoid any kind of air pockets or air bubbles that may have gotten onto the molt. And uh, now I can look inside and it's good news already. I can clearly see the, um, the epigynum there. I see the spermatheca and the um, uterus externus. So here is a clear example right there. That's just a textbook example of the spermatheca. And uh, yeah, if you see this, that's really good news. These, uh, the Gramostola pulcropes has very obvious spermatheca. Other species are not so obvious. So you kind of have to know what you're looking for. And I'll put a piece of paper behind it so that you can clearly see the uterus externus. That is the clear part and the little antenna looking thing, the reddish antenna looking thing, that is the spermatheca. Now it should have two, but I accidentally folded one back when I put the paper in there. But you can clearly see it. Next is the Brachypelma albopelosum. And this one's a little bit more crunched up, so I wasn't so sure about this particular molt. So once I start putting the water into the sternum area as best as I can, you'll see it starts to spread out just a little bit. That's another good thing about placing it there is inside of it, it's not hydrophobic. So it will start to absorb the water into the leg area. And then I just add a little bit of soap, just dab it in there and it quickly spreads. And mostly I'm concerned about the abdominal area right below the sternum area. Add a little bit more water to just kind of soak everything down. And you don't have to leave it for very long. It absorbs the water pretty quickly. Carefully, I'll flatten everything out and try to spread the abdominal area right there below the sternum. That's my main concern. Now this one's a little bit folded up, so it's kind of hard to get it apart. So I really, really have to be careful. All right, so there is the flap there that I need to open up and I'm starting to notice that the abdominal area is ripped. So I may not be able to determine the sex on this one, but we'll see as I get this opened up a little bit further. And sure enough, the area between the two book lungs, the anterior book lungs, which are the top ones, is still preserved, it's still okay. So I still have enough tissue there that I can check for the mold. Now, like I said, it's not so obvious on some species. Albopelosum is not a real obvious one. As you can tell there in the example, you kind of have to do your research ahead of time to see what you're looking for because they don't have a very obvious spermatheca. So now that I know what I'm looking for, I can go in there and I can look for that specific flap there. It's more of a flap and you won't see those little antenna as much like, like you do on the other one. So let me spread this out a little bit better. I'm not worried about that lower part that's all crunched up. That's useless to me. 
but the part that I'm looking for is right here between the two top book lungs. And it's looking a little bit hopeful, but I'm not positive just yet. Once I, once I start probing around, I can clearly see a flap there. Can you see that? It's just kind of flapping over right there. And sure enough, this is a female. There we go, right there you can see that little flap. So that's another female for me. I'm pretty happy about that. So I saved the most difficult one for last, and that is the Delicatheli diamantinensis. And again, do your research ahead of time so that you know what you're looking for. Here's an example of what the spermatheca look like on, these, on this species. And uh, it is a pretty obvious spermatheca, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. But this is a smaller species. This is a dwarf species, so all the parts are smaller. So of course that just makes it that much more difficult to find what you're looking for. All right, so once again, I have to be real careful spreading this ab abdominal region out. And keep in mind, this is a this dwarf species. It's a tiny specimen. So I gotta be extra careful. And it looks like I have an area of the abdomen that is a little bit stuck. And I probably should have waited longer to undo that. But I think I see enough of the uh, anterior book lung there, er, the area right there, to where I can determine the sex. So I'm not gonna be too concerned about it. So yeah, I've got enough that I can look and if I zoom in on there, I'm not really seeing what I'm looking for. It looks pretty empty there. So I'm assuming this might be a male, but you know, my eyes aren't what they were once, so I've, I'm gonna take a closer look. So if I'm still having a hard time seeing the sex of the tarantula, then I'll get my camera out and I'll put my macro lens on there and try to get as close as possible. I'll get a picture and capture as much of the detail so that I can look at it real close and then be sure. So yeah, after snapping a shot of that area, I can clearly see that there is no flap there. There's no spermatheca, so this is most definitely a confirmed male. Well, to add a three ain't bad. Um, I'm ecstatic that my Grandma Stola poker piece has turned out to be female because I love her and I wanted her really bad. I can't wait till she gets full size. She's about three inches right now. So I'm super, super happy about that one. Um, I'm also happy about the uh, Brachypelma albopelosum. Although I think this one is hobby form. I do have a Nicaraguan that I got as a freebie from Fear Not Tarantulas that did turn out to be female. So I'm pretty happy about that one. This one, um, I, I think I got that one as a freebie too, but it wasn't indicated whether it was Nicaraguan or hobby form, so I'm assuming it's hobby form and it is a female. So um, I do have an adult female that I ended up buying and uh, that one is you know, female. So I've got one more and hopefully it'll turn out to be male and I'll have a hobby form that I could breed and I need to get another Nicaraguan. Now, the Delicatheli diamantinensis turned out to be male. I'm almost positive it is. I can always stay hopeful, but I'm pretty sure that it is male. But that's okay. I've got five more tries. Uh, I've got five more of them that I'm waiting for them to molt so I can figure those out. But two out of three ain't bad. That's pretty cool. Uh, always happy to get females.
So you didn't think I'd just leave you without anything else and showing you tarantulas. I've got a couple of feedings to show you, a few feedings to show you, and then we'll wrap this up. This is my Hedriscodra maculata. And unfortunately, she doesn't get much airtime for obvious reasons. She's a very defensive species, and this is typical of her when I go to feed her. She usually will go straight into a threat posture, and those fangs are locked and loaded, and she means business. So I don't pull her out very much. Most of the time, I just observe her when she's out and about, but I tend to leave her alone a lot. And this is my Nandu chromatis. And this is another pretty defensive species. This is kind of typical of the Nandu genus. But um, yeah, I spooked it. So it went into a threat posture and kept trying to attack or scare off the roach. Next up is my Pisilotheria metallica. And um, now that they're about three inches, they're really starting to get their colors in. They're, they're just brilliant blue. And this is a little confirmed male. Hopefully I will get some females out of the five that I have. I'm sure I will, but you never know. I've heard of people getting all males sometimes. This is my Chromatopelma cyanopubescens in her new enclosure looking gorgeous as ever. And she's already started to web up everything as you can see. It's kind of interesting that she's chosen to be more arboreal than terrestrial. She's webbed up all the twigs and everything and she kind of stays on top in the little hammock or canopy that she's created. She sat this way for a good a little while before she finally took the prey after it started wriggling. There you go. I'm so glad that she turned out to be female. She's just beautiful. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can breed her in the future. Right now I'm just content to have her and enjoy her in her new enclosure. This is Ceratogyrus marshalli, the straight horn baboon, but no horn as of yet. They're about two inches, but I heard that they don't really start showing it until after about three inches. The males tend to keep a little nub and the females will actually grow the horn. And this is for Mictopus cancerides, the Haitian brown. I can always count on them to give me a good feeding response. They're excellent eaters. Very food aggressive. And this is Brachypelma hamori, and I'm always happy to see them eat because they go through so many fasting periods. It's like they'll eat for a while and then they just quit eating, but then they pick it up here and there sporadically. And last but not least is my Pisilotheria regalis, and you can clearly see the use of tibial hooks there to flip that roach right out of my tongs. I capture this in slow motion in hopes of getting a nice spectacular takedown, but unfortunately it wasn't as spectacular as some of the ones I'd captured before. But from here on out I think I'm going to try to use slow motion on her every single time so that I can probably capture one of the good takedowns. So that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget, check out Tarantula Shani and Gav's Tarantulas. I'll post a link to their channels down below in the description. If you like this video, please give me a like. 
If you want to see more, subscribe. If you want to support this channel, I have a Redbubble store where I sell Tarantula Haven merchandise. Any of the proceeds from the merchandise will go directly to help grow and support this channel. Until next time, keep loving them tarantulas.